Hello, folks. Welcome back to the Podcast Digest. This is Dan Lizette. Thanks again for taking the time to join me and check out the latest episode. Great conversation and interview. A little bit different, maybe, than uh, you guys are typically used to hearing. Typically, I would feature uh, an interview with a host or producer of a particular show or shows uh, and talk to them about how that show comes together. Um, but this time, I had an opportunity to speak with Erdon Lopez from Wondery, the founder and CEO of Wondery. If you're not familiar with this rather new uh, network of podcasts, you should be. There's a lot of good stuff out there, some high-quality shows happening, and some new stuff uh, coming very soon, uh, which Erdon and I talked about as well. And we covered some other interesting topics uh, towards the end of the conversation that uh, regarding advertising and a lot of the changes that are happening in the podcast space. And uh, Ernan and uh, the, his uh, podcast network, as well as the partnerships he has in place, is sort of uh, at the cutting edge of some of the new things coming down the line. And uh, I asked him some tough questions, and uh, I feel as if I got some really honest responses. So hopefully you'll learn something as well uh, about sort of the future of podcast advertising and, and where this whole industry is moving towards. But before we get uh, started with the talk, I wanted to take just a couple of quick minutes and thank you guys. Uh, thank you very much uh, for sharing the show, for following on Twitter at Pod Digest or liking on Facebook. Just search for the Podcast Digest. Uh, and uh, two other things as well. I'm uh, sort of seeing a lack of uh, iTunes reviews lately, and uh, it hurts my feelings. <laughs> if you guys would, if you've not done so already, uh, and you've listened to a few of the shows and you enjoy, I am a very small, very independent, one-man operation. Uh, and getting exposure for the show via iTunes reviews uh, really, really helps bring a broader audience and allows me to bring these conversations to more and more people. So if you would, a iTunes review or on Google Play, Stitcher, um, tune in wherever you like to listen, uh, a review would be appreciated. Uh, and also Patreon. I haven't talked about it in a few weeks, but uh, there is a link uh, on the webpage, uh, the podcastdigest.info for Patreon. Patreon is going to start to become a bigger deal. I have been turning around in my mind and uh, starting to have conversations uh, with uh, someone else about some future Patreon-only content that could be coming your way. No commitments at this point yet of exactly when or what or how, but I just wanted to let you know that those conversations are happening, and I really want to uh, have a greater um, uh, return for the wonderful people who uh, choose to give as little as a buck a month on Patreon. It's a, it's a big deal to me, and uh, it is sort of the most likely avenue of uh, me being able to uh, put more and more into the Podcast Digest. So please consider supporting the show on Patreon as well. That's enough of the asks, and, uh, and, uh, but the thank yous uh, are really what I wanted to mention. More great stuff coming in the future, guys. Hit subscribe if you haven't done so. But for now, for episode 107, let's get to my conversation with Hernan Lopez from Wondering. Right, folks, as I mentioned up front, my guest this week for episode 107 of the Podcast Digest is the founder and CEO of Wondery, Ernan Lopez. Welcome to the Podcast Digest. Thank you so much, Dan. It's a pleasure to be with you guys. Well, it's wonderful to talk to you, and uh, I want to just kind of do a hat tip and a nod right from the beginning uh, and let folks know there's going to be a link to the show notes. Listeners of this show may also be listeners to Harry Duran over at the Podcast Junkies, and just this week, uh, an episode and a wonderful conversation uh, that Ernan had with Harry came out in a recent episode of Podcast Junkies, so there, there is a bunch of great conversation that happened there as well, so uh, I want to let folks know that I'm going to kind of cover the other half of the story fear, if you will. Uh, and uh, Harry and I are not doing this on purpose, folks. If you are listening to both of us, you know that we've had a lot of duplicate guests and it's not planned. Honestly, it's not. Uh, but Ernan, you, before we jump into uh, your uh, uh, network with Wondery and all the things that are happening, because there's so many things happening, I was wondering if you could take just a moment or two and tell folks a little bit about yourself personally, way before the world of podcasting hit. What uh, sort of, where did you grow up? What were you doing beforehand? I grew up in Argentina and I came to the U.S. at 27, and my, my, my very first job was 
at a radio and cable company, but my very first experience with a microphone was right at um, right after high school. I got kicked out of high school, actually, for being too clever by half. And uh, I went very briefly to do with some friends um, a show at a pirate radio station. And back at the time, this is 26, 27 years ago in Argentina, pirate radio stations were the predecessors of podcasting. They were these open field where anybody could just get a microphone and go and, and get advertisers and, and essentially put a show on. Uh, the only difference is that that was illegal, and this is very much legal, and, and now it's becoming <laughs> a business for a lot of people. And I moved uh, to the U.S. Uh, to work for Fox, where I spent uh, 18, almost 19 really good years in the international channels. When I started, I was a head of advertising sales for the Miami office, and by the time I left, I was running the international channels operation. And for a lot of that time, I had the entrepreneur bug, I really wanted to do something for myself. I really wanted to create a, a company. And, and and I found in podcasting a lot of the dynamics that I saw in cable advertising when I started 20-odd um, years ago in, in Argentina. I saw uh, a marketplace that w was very fragmented, that um, was competing with established legacy players. In that case, was TV. In our case, it's, it's radio. And um, a lot of uh, people that were just trying to figure it out as it, as we all went along, and uh, and and, and I, I I'll never forget when I was working for Fox, one of the great bosses that I had. He was my boss's boss, a guy called Peter Churning. Uh, he run now owns the Churning Group. Um, one day uh, we had been building businesses and building channels for um, for for a while, and when we would, we were in that phase where everything was new and everything was growing. And he told us, you look back at this stage in your careers and you'll always want to replicate that. You'll always want to come back to that moment where everything was about building and about growing and about opening doors and about breaking down barriers as opposed to trying to cling on to the status quo. And uh, that's very much defines what, I'm, what, what I think all of us in the podcasting industry are trying to do. You know, it's funny, Hernan, I wonder sometimes, and a lot of uh, a lot of my audience are other podcasters, and a lot of us live this dream of being able to leave our day jobs to make podcasting a full-time reality. Well, you had a really good job <laughs> with Fox, right? I mean, that, that that's that's not, you know, that's not a uh, entry-level position, so to speak, and you had obviously accomplished a lot in your career there. Was, was there any worry? Was there any fear or trepidation or hesitation in making this jump? Of course there was. But I mean, I had decided first that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So that decision that I didn't want to work, uh, have another, I'm, I'm not saying never, but that I that I had been a corporate executive for long enough. Uh, I had already made that. And why I chose podcasting as opposed to let's say, go and make web videos or make um, uh, games or make the next, try to make the next Pokemon Go. I really wanted to do something that I, I felt passionate about as a user. And I am a very, very engaged user of podcasts. And I, and I found an opportunity both as a consumer uh, that I understood. And, and I think I, I can see how it can be turned into a business. I think. Uh, but time will tell. I'll tell you what, Hernan, I, I got to admit, if, if I had a way of making the next Pokemon Go, I, I might have to do that. <laughs> I, 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 I'll be with you. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying. You know? <laughs> so Wondery was then born, but this is a network a little bit different than what some folks may typically see or, or, or realize as a network. Uh, network. Tell us about sort of your vision for for what you wanted this to be and, and what the first few months, because this just launched at the beginning of this year, correct? Right. We incorporated January 1st, 2016, and, and I quit Fox on the 12th, and I was in my office on the 19th of January. And wow. we got the uh, yeah, first employee on the 25th. And uh, I, I think the first show we brought over, Real Crime Profile, started in April. And uh, that month, we, we closed the month with 700,000 downloads. And in August, we just crossed uh, five and a half million downloads in the month. Um, and now we have 14 shows. But, but essentially... Yeah, the network is different, but it, but, but it has uh, a lot of the elements of, of many of the other networks. So in, in, in a sense that we have both uh, 
Wondery Originals shows and partner shows. So at the same time, the Wondery Originals are shows that we produce here in-house or, or that we co-produce with partners, but we are funding them. We're essentially, they have the Wondery brand, uh, they have our creative input, and they have um, our brand sensibility, and they're all going to be about storytelling in one way or another. And the partner shows are shows that are already being created by um, by independent podcasters, and we help them uh, increase their audiences and find advertisers. Um, so in that that way, we're not that different from mid roll, except that obviously we're you know five years behind mid roll. But, <laughs> right. Uh, but but yes, just like they have Earwolf, uh, the shows that they represent, and they have. Um, you know the the the, the network um, and our representation business. The, those are the the two main parts of our business as well. Yeah, I, I guess the difference I was alluding to was more than the, the the concept that all of the shows are not quote unquote original, not quote unquote homegrown. You have brought shows underneath the umbrella of right. Wondery. Uh, so l- let's start there because th- there's a long conversation I want to have with you about uh, found and some of the things in the pipeline for Wondery. But before we get to the originals, these ones that you have at this point um, that are the partner shows, and I'm looking at the website, I believe, are we at uh, 4, 8, 11? Uh, 12, if 12. I'm not mistaken, but I could be mistaken. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, 11 to, to 12 <laughs> partner shows. Talk about what this means for these shows. What's the difference for them uh, as creators, hosts, producers? And then the flip side of that coin, what's the difference for listeners of these shows? Um, well, I'll tell you one example of a show, and I hope I, I'm not making them a disservice by by revealing numbers. But actually, I mean, let, let me not say numbers. The Vanish, uh, when it came to us, it was already a really good show. And, the, and, and it was just getting started. It was a few months old. It was getting you know, X thousand listeners and per episode and the host of the show and us worked hand in hand on creating new artwork on developing cross promotional opportunities um on we made introductions with other partner shows actually that show came recommended by another um crime show real crime profile uh of ours so she went and and yeah, invested in in audio equipment and and improved the audio quality of the show um, and then we uh, started to um, reach out to Apple to make sure that the show will be appropriately featured on all the places where it needs to be featured. Now the show has five times the audience that it did when it reached us. And, um, and it's only been a, a short few months. That's probably one of the best case studies of, of what shows that appears with us. But Stories Podcast uh, has grown and there has pretty much every show that has uh, been added to the network has a bigger audience than it did before, and most of the shows had no advertisers before, uh, with a few exceptions. Um, and and now they all have advertisers. So, what would you primarily attribute that to as Wondery's influence? Are we talking sound quality, promotion, marketing, all of it? What 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 do you think was sort of the magic sauce to to help that type of growth? I, I don't think there's one single element, but there are there are a number of things that. We want to make sure that all the shows consider. And by the way, the partner shows we don't own, right? They own by our partners, and they're you know their contracts typically for a year with extensions, and they are very much in in, in control of their destiny. But um, two things that we do: on, on the one hand, we help them create strategies to hold on to and increase their audience by having a consistent uh, schedule by being very meticulous about the show notes, but improving the quality of the key art. But some people underappreciate the, the key art and, and how, how how much of a difference it makes, um, making sure that they have the appropriate call to action at the end of each episode and they, they say the right words that prompt people to, um, um, to write reviews and to recommend the shows to their friends. Uh, we include a survey at the end of each show so that everybody, all the listeners, give us their information. So when we go to the advertising agents, we, we can say this um, show has 90% female listeners and that show has 80% male listeners. Um, the other thing that we do is we work with the hosts on improving the quality of the ads. Um, and and uh, by improving the quality, the, there's, there's two levels. One is essentially doing the kind of ads that convert better to sales. Um, and the second one is doing the kind of ads that listeners 
really enjoy listening to. And just to give an example, uh, if you guys listen to Found, uh, you're going to notice on the Blue Apron ad or on the Look Great ad um, that there are sound effects in the background. And we use those sound effects. We actually we talked about those on the podcast um, Upfront uh, IAB event yesterday, or two days ago, rather. Um, we call them immersive ads. This is essentially ads that allow or prompt listeners to imagine themselves in uh, the experience of using the products or the services being or, or the services being advertised. Interesting. So, yeah, advertising is another another topic I definitely want to get into, and that's 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 a really neat tidbit on one of the things that Wondery is doing. Um, but before I jump into that, I, I, I want to make sure that that. Um, folks uh, understand sort of the difference between partner shows and the originals that so for the partner shows that we've just described we're talking about literally that right a, a, a partnership where you guys are helping with you know advertising and calls to action and, and maybe some things on audio quality and, and and that type of thing and it's more about uh, monetization and audience growth than creative or content or, or, or direction with, with story or anything like that. Yes? That is exactly right. Gotcha. But on the original side, different story. The one people can go and listen to right now, launched at the end of July, that's Found. Tell folks about Found. Found is an amazing show. It's uh, based on a magazine uh, that's been around for 15 years, created by David Rothbard. And he tells the story in such beautiful terms. Uh, but but essentially, David, who's from Chicago, one day he was in the um, at night, walked out of um, his office to his car, and he found on the windshield of his car a note uh, full of expletives, uh, very emotional. You can find it on the on the wonder.com website. Um, and from that note that was meant for a cheating boyfriend, but it was mistakenly put on the windshield of his car, he essentially developed a love of lost and found notes, and he started to find them all over the place. And so he created a handmade magazine, which then turned into a once-a-year magazine, which then turned into uh, three New York Times bestselling books, a musical, a live tour, and now this podcast and an app. And um, what, what he does is essentially with all the notes that he's been collecting from people from all over the world, Use, he uses these notes as a lens to talk about personal stories of um, relationship and transformation and love and loss and aspiration. And sometimes he tracks down the people that actually wrote the notes. Uh, one of the, 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 I mean, so far our most popular um, episode was Found Baby, not about a found note, but about actually a found baby in the subway in New York 16 years ago. Uh, but it, it's if you want to get a sense of what the show stands for, you should listen to that episode first. Um, it's been very well reviewed, critically acclaimed on USA Today, on Wired, on Entertainment Weekly. It's, it's a really, really special show. It was that was an excellent episode. I, I, one of the one of the things I like to do here, uh, Aaron, on, on the podcast digest. I'm not sure if you've heard any of my conversations before. Is sort of take people sort of behind the scenes. And what I'm yes. curious about is how did you in the Wondery team partner with Davey and f make Found into a podcast? You mentioned these other entertainment mediums that it had a place, a magazine, a live show, which I understand is coming actually to my neck of the woods. I'm I'm, I'm living in a Philadelphia suburb, uh, right? But but uh, but, but so when you guys are looking to launch this first original, how how did the story go that you landed on Found? They actually contacted us. Uh, it just happened that the time it was very fortunate that we came out with the announcement of launching the company at the time that they were looking for a partner uh, to launch the show. The, the, the rights to the show are held by Found Musical by, by three companies, um, Victoria Lang, Eva Price, and Jamie Salka together with Killer Content, Adrian uh, Becker, and, and they reached out to us. So we worked together hand in hand because the pilot that they brought to us was not the show that we ended up doing. I, I, we, we, we gave very significant input about the kind of stories I wanted to tell, and, and we made the show a little less about the hunt for the note or the hunt for the person uh, that wrote the note and more about the personal story behind it. So if you listen to the last episode, for instance, um, uh, episode five, it used to work for the Bulls, where we interview uh, Craig Hodges, um, a former NBA player who did 
I can't remember how it was, I think, 16 years ago, very much what Colin Kaepernick uh, did uh, a couple of weeks ago. He essentially stood out for something that he believed in, uh, the difference that this guy was blacklisted from the NBA uh, for what he did, even though he was, he put, he won two uh, titles for the Chicago Bulls. He was, you know, one of the best, um, you know, th- th- three uh um, one of the best shooters in, in the NBA, and he was an amazing athlete. He did not get his contract renewed, and not a single NBA team touched him. Contrast that with how um, um, you know, today you know, an athlete can do activism and, and not his career can, um, won't suffer for it. So those are the kind of stories that we really want to get behind. We, we, we essentially we use, yes, this um, tiny piece of paper as a as an excuse, almost as a lens to talk about um, the lives of strangers and things that affect all of us in, in ways that we sometimes don't realize. Yeah, well, I want to tell a little story myself, if I can. And, and I hope you can, you can flesh out for me, again, the behind the scenes story about how this happened. The very first time I heard about Found was at Podcast Movement, which I heard through that episode, again, link in the show notes to Podcast Junkies, that you were there. I did not know you were there. I spoke with um, the uh, lady whose name begins with C at the table. Christina. I spoke with Christina at length at the table at that time. I'm not sure if you were there and I just didn't meet you or not. But uh, at Podcast Movement, the very first time I heard about Found was during the, I believe it was the awards presentation, where you guys had had multiple copies of a handful of found notes on the bottom of the chairs for everyone right. who was sitting there. And then at a point in the presentation, it was pointed out and we all reached down and found these notes. And I thought it was a brilliant piece of raising awareness for this soon to launch show. And I'm curious now, since I'm talking to you, if you can kind of fill us in on how that piece of information uh, all got set up. That did that idea, that stunt. I, I, I'll tell you the backstory because I'm, I'm, I hope, you know, it, no, no, nobody will will be, uh, um, no, nobody will be um, too uh, surprised by what I'm going to say. But when you're a new company, we you want to get the word out in any possible way, and we were a sponsor of um, the pet. Well, actually, an exhibitor. We weren't a sponsor. We we're an exhibitor of the festival. As as part of the exhibitor, we got the chance to introduce an award. And I knew that, you know, how conferences go in general, most people swing by your booth. You're lucky if you get 10% of the 2,000 people to pay attention to you. But if you can get one message in the one place where everybody's listening, um, then you got 1,500 people listening. at the same plus the people that, that will be tweeting. Um, so I asked uh, Dan Franks, who runs the conference for me, role, uh, can I introduce an award? He said, yes. Can I introduce the comedy award? Yes. Uh, how much time do I have? Uh, 30 seconds to, you know, no more than a minute. And uh, I think, okay, how can I possibly plug <laughs> found in a way <laughs> that is organic and doesn't seem too overly uh, shoehorned in? Um and, um, and 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 that, that people will appreciate, it, especially given that I'm interested in comedy. And so I, I'm trying to remember ex- my exact words, but but the, essentially the idea was we wanted to get people to look at that um, pamphlet that we put together over a week, and actually we printed it here at the office, and we cut it in half. And the next day, the three of us, um, Christina, Mick, and I, we all went and we we taped it between the three of us <laughs> under 1,500 chairs. I mean, th- this is how. How 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 just homegrown uh, we we were. So and did Dan know that was coming? He did, he did. Okay. But I told him I, I told him only the day I asked for permission. Yeah, and, okay. uh, and yeah, he said yes. And um, and but the reason why I thought that it would be relevant is that um, the Papa podcast movement was in Chicago and this happened. Um, um, you know, found was created in Chicago, right? So I made a reference to that found note, the dear Mario note, as we call it, which was found 15 years ago. I said 15 years ago, not too far away uh, from here, uh, David Rothbard found in the windshield of his car um, a note. And when you find a note in the windshield of your car, they're usually full of cursing. And this one did too. Um, 
And that that little note started a movement that started a magazine that then started um, a podcast um, like the one that we're about to present, a very funny podcast like the one we were, we're about to present. And so if you want to know, know more about that podcast and be part of that movement, please look under your chair and uh, you're going to find a way to, to do it. And that's how people look at the pamphlet under the chair. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so good. <laughs> and you, you know what's funny is is that that is a mechanism that is used in various other settings, right? Holiday Christmas parties, sometimes at a right. wedding or things of that nature. And it seemed to be to me that that awards night would have been the last time or the last place you would see such a tool utilized, which made it that much more impactful to folks, I think. And the idea of finding something under your chair for an up-and-coming right. show named Found was just so apropos, and I thought it was great execution by you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was, there was not without risk, but I, but yeah. I think it went well. <laughs> I think it was uh, it was excellent, that's for sure. Because then, then afterwards, everybody was comparing them, which, uh, right. I, you know, I was. That's so, right. Which one because did you we had yeah. we had six different versions. We thought about it. Do we do the same one for everybody? And then we said, no, let's do six different versions so that people can look at which one the other one has. Yeah, it was uh, well executed, That for, that's for sure. So Thank you. Uh, so that is uh, the first and, and uh, current day present. I meant to mention this uh, before we hit record or not, but this episode is going live to folks on Sunday the 11th. Um, right. So we are within uh, uh, just over a week from the second show coming out that folks can now hear the teaser for today in iTunes. And it's the second one from the uh, original Camp for Wondery. Uh, what's that all about? Uh, the, it's multiple teasers, actually. It's called Secrets, Crimes, and Audio Tape. And it's an audio drama told week after week. And let me unpack that because, A, first we're talking about audio drama, which is most people don't even know what it is. But we compare it to a TV show by using only sound and your imagination. And, and the comparison with, with TV, I think, is very relevant because a lot of people ask me when I came from TV to audio, like when you, you people are on TV, they say, well, TV is everything, right? Uh, the same way that... In the 50s, people that worked in movies, they thought that movies was everything and TV was. And, and so how is an audio drama a better experience than a TV show? Um, well, if you're watching a TV show, you're actually outside of the action looking at a picture that was designed by the writer or the director with a specific sensibility in mind, right? So the the director has decided that that actress will be blonde and that actor will have uh, black hair and that the building will be this color and that the street will have so many cars. When you're listening to an audio drama, you're immersing it. You're in the action. You're not watching. You're inside of the action and you're making all those pictures yourself. So it's a much more real and vivid experience when you listen to it right. You have to listen to it with both ears and, and with full attention. But it, it's um, essentially you create a mental picture that is so much richer than any picture that you can see. And this new show coming up um, starts off with a uh, series of episodes um, that that is uh, telling a tale. Can you tell folks what they will be hearing first? Yes. They'll, the first tale, the first story they'll hear is called A Beautiful Spell. And it's a comedy uh, about a married couple um, that Franny and Jim, they've been married for 12 years and they wake up in the middle of the night afraid that they may have fallen out of love with one another. And throughout the whole night, they'll walk through their insecurities and their jealousies and their fantasies and they end up doing role playing. And it's, it gets from funny to very deep to very funny back and forth multiple times. A really, really special play starred by uh, Jenna Elfman, you remember, of uh, Dharma of Drum and Greg, and uh, her husband, Body Elfman, of Criminal Minds. So, and I know there's there's even more to come. You guys are intending to use, and often, in many cases, actors and performers that people are familiar with, and in some case, uh, you know, are, are well-established in, in the Hollywood scene. How does something like this come together? Obviously, you guys have to identify story. There's the production, the studio, and the, and the, the, the mixing and editing Talk to us about what Secrets, Crimes, and Audio Type uh, production will look like. Yes. I, uh, before we, we move to that, I, I want to clarify that 
it, all these stories are um, close-ended, so they're, they're individual stories. Some will be one episode, some will be six episodes, but there, it's not a series. It's right. more, it is essentially, they're, they're, they're multiple stories. And um, the way the production comes out, obviously we, we work with writers both on original material as well as adaptations either from theater plays or, or from um, radio dramas done in the UK. Uh, two of those are are, are, um, are are already come to us that way. And um, once the script is done, everything's about the script. I mean, people forget that, you know, it, without a good script, you just don't have a show in any medium. And once the script is where it needs to be, it's fairly easy to cast because you'll go to an actor. There are a number of actors that have been doing voice. It's not a very well-known world but 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 it the, 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 there are more actors that that you think that have been doing voice and many of them do voiceover for animation or, or for movies um and yeah a show like a beautiful spell was recorded over three days took about and that's three half hour episodes took about two weeks of post-production probably a little more than 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 it would normally because it, it was our first one but we are a really talented group of uh, directors specialized in audio drama and editors specialized in audio drama, and, and they put it together beautifully. And and then what, what what we do at the end is we add a narration. So in the the teaser, you'll you hear the voice of David Reinstrom, the the host of Secret Crimes and Audio Tape. He also hosts another partner show of ours called um, Radio Drama Revival, uh, and he loves audio drama, and and he's he's actually allowing listeners to get some context and um, and continuity between the different stories and having the non-insignificant task of reading the ads as well, because that's one of the challenges otherwise in audio drama. In, in, in podcasting, you need somebody to read good ads, right? So, And we, we're not going to be able to ask Jenna Elfman to read the ads, obviously. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll draw one parallel. You mentioned a lot of folks may not be familiar with audio dramas, and you already referred to one of the partner shows, and I believe you have a couple of the partner shows, right, that, that are yeah. in sort of that genre. That, yeah, they're, they're cleansed. Yeah, I, I, I am a huge fan of one outside of the Wondery world and, and has been a previous guest on this show, and, and folks listening that I have... Uh, potentially turned uh, onto this before, I would put this in a very similar category. And Ernan, I mean this in the absolute best, most complimentary way. Uh, it's very similar to the truth from Radiotopia and Jonathan Mitchell. Uh, it is in in terms of you know sort of a scripted audio performance that really is immersive, and it's that type of experience. And uh, you know, if 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 you guys can be mentioned in the same category of them, you, you're definitely onto something great. Because to me, the truth is uh, one of the uh, you know. Bare Errors of of sort of the uh, audio drama in the podcasting space today. It, it is absolutely alongside with Limetown, uh, Tannis, Black Tape, um, Alice Isn't Dead, um, the Black, um, the um, the Bright Sessions is a yes. relatively new audio drama that's very well produced by Lauren Ship and out of here in, in Los Angeles. So, but there aren't that many if you think no, about it. It no. is not, and and partially because there hasn't been. If you think about all the shows that I just mentioned, with the exception of The Truth, which is done by Radiotopia, all the other ones were done by single entrepreneurs out of love of the medium. Yeah. Right? It's, they weren't created by a company with with, um, with with the goal of turning them into a business. Um, so um, I, I think you're going to see more and more attention to the audio drama space. I hope that people appreciate what we're trying to do. Uh Particularly given that one of the marketing challenges that we're going to have is that all the stories are so different that it's almost impossible that somebody will like them all. Right, so, right, right, right. So if you like the comedy, uh, A Beautiful Spell, um, how the chance that you're going to like the next story, which is an histor- historical drama about the assassination of JFK uh, called Air Force One, are not that great. <laughs> but unless you're among those people that really enjoy audio drama, right? Right. Um, but but that's, I, I think that's the beat. We, we want to build a really big tent and expose listeners to audio drama than at the most, at the best professional quality. And then on the back of Secret Scrums and Audio Tip, we will launch other ongoing series. We have six other series in development, and wow. uh, but, but those are more 
that that's that's where we are going. That the you know, multiple seasons, thirteen episodes per season, kind of uh, kind of show. Uh, I'm certainly looking forward to what's next. That's for sure. Uh, the other big topic I wanted to talk to you about, Ernan, is is a big sort of tentpole topic, if you will. And I think right now you mentioned that you were at the second annual uh, podcast up front with IAB yet uh, the other day, two days ago. I was uh, as we're recording, which is probably you know like five six days ago for people listening, but um, advertising. And you, you've made uh, comments to this already about building a business out of this. Obviously, you don't uh, – sort of the question I asked you earlier about uh, leaving your corporate career uh, for this venture. Obviously, in the type of things – you know, with audio dramas, one of the things I was thinking was the reason you don't see many is that these aren't easy to do. There's a very intensive, you know, production process between acting and, and writing and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and to make this all work, um, there obviously has to be a monetization strategy. Um, and yourself and Wondery are, have been some of the early partners here in 2016, sort of moving things in bit of a different direction. And a lot of that I, I know hinges with your partnership with Art19. And before I get into several questions I have, I want you to sort of tell folks about what you guys are doing that's a, a, a little bit different than what a lot of listeners or even podcast hosts may know as their current understanding of podcast ads. Yeah, so what we do with R19 uh, is dynamic ad insertion. We, uh, we record the ads with the host, so they sound exactly like the ads that you would listen to in any podcast. They're either endorsement or they're host read, um, but they're read by the host or or, or, uh, or endorsed by the host in their own timing and in their own pace. So they can be 45 seconds, they can be a minute and, and 37 seconds. It, it really doesn't matter. So it has to be an organic ad. Uh, but then we cut it and we insert it back dynamically at the moment that the download request is made. So the, the effect of that is that uh, if you're listening to an ad for an episode that was produced six months ago, but it is Black Friday and your advertiser is Best Buy and you want a specific message for Black Friday, you can actually do that message for that day and that day alone. Or another thing we're doing, we, we have uh, one food delivery service that is not available uh, in every uh, DMA in the, in the country. So they only wanted to advertise in the DMAs in the cities where they actually have the service. And we can do that as well. We can essentially target city by city. Um, what's really interesting for podcasters is that, so that those were the benefits for the advertisers. For podcasters, that allows you to multiply the inventory because if you are um, a, a podcaster that has a show that has 10,000 listeners, right? And, and you could charge a rate based on the 10,000 listeners that you're going to get typically either over the 30, um, 30 month period or the 45 month period. If you count your, your audience that way, you're going to have, and you, you have a weekly show, you're going to have 40,000 listeners impressions per month to sell. But if you look at your entire catalog, you may have 200,000 listeners to sell. It's just that the technology allows us to come in and insert ads in every single, very seamlessly, very easily, in every single ad, in every single episode, and cross your entire catalog. And that's how you really multiply the, the inventory available. So let me ask you about the third side of that equation. Uh, and this is the one that is often raised by a lot of the third-party podcast players, podcast aggregators, the existing hosting services uh, that primarily host independent podcasters. And that is the, the, the side of the equation that is the listener. Built into this is, a, is an assumption that a listener would be accepting of more ads. Now, there is this, of course, inherent concept, right, that to use your example, if there's an episode six months old, you don't want to hear about an Easter ad during Halloween and that a Halloween ad may be more relevant to you. So thus, that might be more uh, listener engaging due to its time or location relevancy. But what about the person that, that may say that, this delivery method clearly is playing upon either my location or it is now seeping into data that I'm not comfortable with sharing. What's your response to those type of concerns? The listener won't see a difference in the number of ads. In fact, this 
um, uh, technology allows podcasters to make the same amount of revenue selling less ads that, that they otherwise would because you're able to monetize every single listener. And as far as the uh, technology allowing people to target using location, that's, that's something that happens across the entire ecosystem. And when, when, when you are um, listening to a radio spot, that's, that radio spot is targeted to your DMA. Um, um, when you're being served with advertising online, that advertising online knows what your IP is. I, I, I think it's a concern that, that quite frankly, not, not, not so many people have expressed um, and I think it's far um, offset by the benefits that come to uh, with, with, the, with, with the ability that this technology gives for podcasters to continue to produce shows of great quality for free for the listeners. So you mentioned Wondery, and you're, you're, I'm assuming you're driving this, and, I, and, I, and my compliments to you for doing so, that the ad that would be dynamically inserted would be an authentic host read. I think, by and large, most people agree that a host read or host endorsement tends to play a lot better uh, with a listener who, uh, you know, I, I have this line I've been saying with a lot of these conversations, people come for the content, but they stay for the hosts. Uh, right. And that's because they often uh, develop an, an uh, almost a perceived personal relationship with that host. So that host read right. is important. But yes. that's you and Wondery. Right. If Art19's technology, uh, you know, prevails in, in, in terms of uh, satisfying an advertiser need for this ability and this ret- you know, ROI in terms of data, what's to stop some less uh, than, you know, honorable players to start inserting those pre-recorded radio ads, to start inserting, you know, uh, audio only of a video ad and, and, and then up the quantity because the fact that this technology exists. Is there a concern for you that, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about like the, the free tier on Pandora yeah. is full of ads, but, right. you know, what do you think is going to happen in that space? Well, I, I think that's happening already. I mean, that's a decision that each host does. We don't do that. Actually, when, when, when people say to us, do you do ad injection? We say, no, we don't do ad injection. We do host read ads or endorsements that happen to be dynamically inserted. But the words ad injection typically remind me of those very loud radio ads that, are, that just sound out of place in the podcast environment. Right. Will they ever sound out of place? I, I think for a long time they will. And the reason why, um, uh, Dan, why, why host rate ads are the norm is that they get the best CPMs because they convert the most into sales. I mean, right. the, all the DR agencies, any other media in the world, DR response pays the lowest rate. Yeah. Right, and in podcasting, they pay very healthy rates. Why? Because the ads work. But the the only ads that work for them are the host reads and the and the dynamic insertion and the uh, endorsement uh, dynamic insertion. Slight shift in topic, Hernan. In the interest of monetization, what are your thoughts, either personally or or potentially for Wondery? On some of the other monetization strategies we see in play, I know in your conversation with Harry, you guys talked a lot about Gimlet Media. They feature, uh, in addition to their ads and and, and branded shows, um, also the membership type style. So in terms of a branded show or membership, is that something that you see as a potential avenue to explore in the future? Oh yes, definitely. Um, branded shows were already conversations with uh, with brands uh, for for producing. In fact, that's one of the, the reasons why I only have until 4 p.m. But, the, <laughs> but, the, but, but we're also in the future. Once we have critical mass of shows, we'll, we'll probably do something along the lines of what Kim Led and other companies have done. It, it's, you, you need to have multiple revenue streams. I, th- I think any business, it's really hard for any business that produces uh, quality content to survive on advertising alone on the long run. And membership, is that something that you see, you know, sort of listener direct support? I kind of put Patreon in the same category as, as a membership type thing. Do you, do you foresee that being as something worth exploring? Yes. So, so someday there may be a, a, a Gimlet style Wondery membership, <laughs> possibly. Yes, possibly. <laughs> uh, w- one more question on the ads, and then we'll, we'll leave this topic because one of the things that I've heard about, um, dynamic insertion or, or injection or, or all of those terms, one of the things that is an inherent problem in that is that there has to be 
I, I believe Art 19's basing everything on an API as opposed to the standard RSS. And then there's questions also in those third party aggregators or even Google Play or the Apple Podcast app. What do you see as the ability to circumvent or, or overcome the hurdles that are presented with some of the delivery uh, challenges that, that are faced with this? Um, I don't think that delivery challenges are any different for, um, for, for dynamically inserted ads versus baked in ads. Um, the, 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 the infrastructure is exactly the same. The only thing you, I can think about is that there are some podcatchers that rehost the content but then what you do is you you tell them you need to essentially rehost the content with the ads and refresh it at the same time we refresh the ads. So I I, I don't see such challenge. So so this dynamic insertion is happening on your hosted RSS. It's not necessarily a technology that could be applied widely unless it was sort of with an Art19 technology infrastructure in place. Well, well I, all of our shows are hosted on R19. Let me make sure I understand the, the question right. You're asking whether um, whether the dynamic ad insertion can somehow be circumvented or, or depending could, on the player? How could it expand, I guess, is my question. Would oh. you see this as something more broader or would it require basic changes to either the standard RSS approach or the podcast players? It doesn't. It doesn't. No, so it's all a matter of adoption, right? I mean, the more, I mean R19 just uh, signed up New York Times as another you know significant publisher, you know, they, they have deals with Midroll, with uh, digital media, with us, with a number of independent podcasters, with Fox Sports. So they are becoming the de facto solution for uh, dynamic ad insertion. And, and it, it's the only platform that was created with the podcasting industry in mind, as opposed to adapted from another industry. So um, I can speak of them highly enough. And as, and as far as you're concerned, listeners should be more concerned with the idea of more relevant, more higher quality ads than necessarily any data sharing going different directions. Absolutely. Gotcha. Well, I, I appreciate you uh, letting me kind of go down that road because I've been reading about this for the last few months especially, and, and I would sort of wanted to ask many of these questions, and I'm assuming a lot of people listening were kind of wondering the same, so... Uh, to the extent that to the extent that they're all podcasters, I mean, they, yeah, I know there are a lot of myths uh, going around, and but they, they 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 should pick up the phone and talk to the guys at R19 because they look. I've been using the platform for almost a year now, and 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 you you can talk to the guys at Mirror, you can talk to anybody who uses the platform, and and, and other there are other solutions as well, and uh, you, you'll find that after you use it, that all these concerns are overblown. Yeah, and that's that's why I wanted to ask, like you said, because there are a lot of myths. There are a lot of questions. Yeah. It's a it's a huge topic of conversation right now um, from from the bits of the industry I'm exposed to. So I, I really appreciate you sharing your your insights and your your perspective on this because I've learned I've learned a lot. So right. <laughs> before I let you go, Hernan, please take take just a few moments. Tell everybody where they can find more about Wondery, the both the partner shows and the originals and, and the new stuff that's coming out. Yeah, so all of our shows are available on Wondery.com and uh, on anywhere where you listen to podcasts, on iTunes, on Stitcher, on uh, Podcast Addict, on Podbean, you name it. The, um, and then and we, 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 I think we, we do a very good job at letting listeners know ahead of time what uh, we are going to be doing. We have a Wondery Facebook page and Twitter page, and each of our shows has their own page as well. And the, the one thing that I really want to leave our listeners with is I want them to go and try Secret Scrum and Auditor, especially over the next seven days as we're heading to September 20th, because you'll find today uh, four different teasers that will give you a sense of the kind of shows that we're going to be putting on, on this series. One is a musical. It's called Wait, Wait, Don't Kill Me. <laughs> it's a parody of Serial. Uh, it's the unauthorized musical parody of Serial that you didn't know you needed. Uh, <laughs> fascinating story. Very funny. Bizarre comedy. Um, you're going to find a preview of Air Force One, a preview of A Handmaid's Tale, a dystopian novel, I mean, based on a novel by Margaret Atwood. This has been turned into a movie already. And, um, and, and we're essentially going to, we already have a lineup that takes us into next year. And, uh, and that lineup includes some of the other drama shows that we're going to launch on the back of Secret Scrounge and Auditech. 
I, I can't wait. I'm super excited. Like I said, a wonder he made an impression on me starting in podcast movement, a wonderful conversation at the, at the exhibit table there. And then uh, through the episodes of found and, and the new stuff coming up, I'm excited about it. And uh, Aaron Lopez, thank you very much for taking the time to join me today. Thank you. And the last thing before I leave you, because sure. I know that many of your podcast um, listeners are podcast podcasters themselves. Yeah. We are, uh, if anybody wants to talk about how to join the network, obviously we have, we, there are some kind of shows that we're looking at that we're more interested in, in, in having with, and, and in particular, um, and obviously there are minimal number of listeners, but uh, there's a page on the on wonder.com uh, for podcasters and that's the best way to contact us. Perfect. And links, as always, folks, will be in the show notes. I really hope that you guys enjoy this conversation and, and, and learn something like I did. So uh, again, Hernan, thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. It was my pleasure. And folks, that'll do it for episode 107 of the Podcast Digest. Until next time, my name's Dan Lizette, and I will talk to you then. Thank you for listening to the Podcast Digest. You can follow the show on Twitter at PodDigest. Like the show on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the Podcast Digest. Email the show feedback at thepodcastdigest at gmail.com. And you can find all the previous episodes and exclusive blog entries at the show's website, thepodcastdigest.info.